Today is Tuesday, November 5th, 2013. My name is Martin Frank, and I'm here in the Department of Physiology at Jefferson Medical College to interview a friend and colleague, Dr. Marion Sigmund. Marion has been affiliated with Jefferson Medical College in the Department of Physiology since 1967, and she has been a dues-paying member of the APS since 1975. Thank you for the money, Marion. Uh, Marion has made her career focusing on smooth muscle contractility and energetics, and she has published numerous papers in this area of research. In this interview, we will learn about the development of Marion's career and about her teaching and research uh, contributions. Marion, thank you for joining me for the Society's Living History Program and for your willingness to be part of this interview series. Thanks for coming. I could hardly refuse you. Thank you. Let us start. Uh, I think it's nice to start with you providing some background into what shaped your career, your childhood, and your upbringing. And I think that'll help us understand how you got to your current career position. Well, I consider myself rather fortunate. I grew up in a medical household. My father was a physician. He was a general practitioner graduated from the University of Vienna in the early 1920s, um, came to America with my mother and brother in 1927, and set up a medical practice. Uh, as was typical at that time, uh, physicians had neighborhood offices. You didn't go downtown to an office building to see your doc. So he was literally the corner doctor and uh, the arrangement was that they would rent an apartment to live in and an adjoining apartment for the medical offices. Um, so that was, that, that was basically the, the structure of the household that lasted uh, my whole life. Um, the separation between the office and the uh, apartment was uh, officially a door, but to me the door was never closed. Uh, the office became a rather unique playground for me and my friends when my father was out making house calls. I mean, who else could offer the opportunity to play chemist with all of his uh, little bottles and droppers that he had available and just explore the mysteries of the uh, apparatus he had in his office. But what was very important was uh, he put up with my incessant curiosity about what was going on in the office, how things worked, and always was very willing and enthusiastic about teaching me. And um, basically this set the stage, I think, for programming at least my mindset that medicine was uber alles. It was uh, the most noble of professions and something that was basically very enjoyable and provided a happy environment. Last night while we were talking, you recounted a couple of experiences you had with your father and how he helped you to explore the natural world in, in, the, in his offices. Well, there were a lot of things that we did together. Um, he, he had almost every device one would need for a making a decent diagnosis from doing his own x-ray work. My mother used to mix barium, and she knew to flavor it because it was awful and couldn't imagine how people could drink that stuff. And that was part of her Viennese cuisine background, I think. But um, so I learned uh, about fluoroscopy, x-ray. He taught me how to develop film. He was an avid photographer. He took pictures of all the babies. He he had delivered um, and did the enlarging and, and printing. And soon enough, he let me do, you know, carry the paper from tray to tray and learn the process. And that was incredible because to this day, I'm an avid fan of photography and that's really my, one of my biggest hobbies. So this was typical. Um, patients, uh, I could not distinguish patients from relatives and family. I politely called them uncle or auntie, whatever was appropriate. And um, 
it, it was an amazing environment. After you uh, got your high school degree, you went off to college, and the obvious question is, how did a Brooklyn girl end up at Tulane? Well, that's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, basically, it was a collision of two factors. One was that when I applied to college, this was now t for entrance in 1950, uh, the United States had not quite gotten over the practice of quotas, religious quotas, in many of our American colleges. And this was well known to my brother and to an older cousin, both of whom were interested in careers in medicine. My brother was more than 13 years older than me, so there was a big generational gap between us. But the cousin warned him that there would be problems of anti-Semitism that might limit his acceptance but advised him to go to Tulane University in New Orleans. And both my cousin and my brother did, and my brother Felix graduated from Tulane Medical School in 1944. Um, it was also quite a, a different environment in New Orleans, clearly very different from our home and neighborhood in Brooklyn. And the good brother uh, thought it would be very good for me to get out and see the world escape the uh, umbilical cord and move to a, a fascinating city, which New Orleans proved to, do, to be. And of course, I, I went there. I didn't need much of a push. And it was one of the most glorious periods of my life. So um, got, a great, I think, a great education there. And it was an eye-opener, not only in terms of cuisine, but of life in general and what the rest of the world was like. After you graduated, you took a few years off before you decided to go on and pursue a doctorate. Yeah. Uh, what was going on in shaping that period of your time, your well, life? Well, this was a kind of a, an interesting period because given the background of my home life uh, and really being certain that the only course for me was medicine, the practice of medicine, Finally, getting to college and being exposed to a myriad of courses in science, the variety was enormous. I mean, not many people I knew got to uh, hike through the bayou and, in a plant ecology course or, um, I mean, see things that I never imagined I would see. And the exposure to so many different co science courses basically awakened me to what it was all about. It wasn't just seeing patients. There was a, obviously a scientific basis to all of this. And I was fascinated by it. And what helped a great deal was uh, the arrival of a young genetics professor, a recent graduate of uh, Columbia University, who took over the biology courses. And uh, he invited me to help him with his experiments in his lab. And that was my first chance to really see research, even that at the simple level he let me uh, get involved in. Um, and I thought, wow, this is fun. It's hands-on. Well, what kind of research were you doing there? Well, <laughs> he was interested in genetics, and he was doing experiments on frogs. And you cannot imagine how happy I was when he asked me if I would please prepare the daily diet of these little tadpoles. And my chore, <laughs> nothing life-threatening, was to uh, boil eggs and spinach, make a mush, and soften it enough to feed the tadpoles with. This was amazing. And I, I quickly uh, became an expert at that. And then he, we moved on to more serious stuff, where I got to do dissections and preparations for histology and some real science. And after you graduated, you did some traveling and uh, oh, ultimately yes. ended up at the Karolinska. Right. Well, I always had a wanderlust, and I think it started when I learned to use roller skates at the age of three. <laughs> so I always wanted wheels and uh, got a car for graduation. and. From high school or college? This is from college, a Chevy convertible that John Travolta would have loved, turquoise and white, just spectacular. Uh, 
drove around the United States with friends. And that was the prerequisite for foreign travel, because my first goal was to go to Europe. My parents said, see America first. So 10,000 miles and six weeks later, I had seen all the national parks. But then the goal was to go to Europe. So uh, I did and had a fantastic uh, trip there. But what we've kind of skipped a period uh, because I did graduate from Tulane right. at the ripe old age of 20, absolutely frightened of the world not knowing what I was going to do now that medicine was clearly not a goal. So I thought it would be a good idea to get a job in a research lab. And a couple of my classmates from Tulane had come to New York and asked for, uh, let's get together to do some sightseeing. And we took a boat ride around Manhattan on the Circle Line. And we passed by the Queensboro Bridge in the East River and the guide pointed to the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research. Well, that was like lightning struck because I thought, aha, that's where it is. Let's see what's going on. And the following Monday, that was just two days later, I was in their employment office and managed to get a job in the laboratory of Paul Weiss, the famous developmental biologist. That was a monumental day in my life. Um, I spent some wonderful years there, uh, exposed to new technology that I had never imagined uh, existed, got to learn tissue culture, electron microscopy, various animal surgeries for growing organs and tissues, not only in culture in eggs, which was more traditional, but even in the abdomen of uh, rodents. The people I worked with were amazing. Aaron Moscona, who was the first uh, to develop the techniques for isolating single cells from tissues. He was there. Uh, John Randall, the well-known structural biologist from King's College London, came and he, he was interested in the structure of paramyosin. And I basically became the technician for these gentlemen. And they never grew tired of my questions. I kind of felt like a puppy being trained by them because the more I asked, the more they answered. And we formed very strong bonds that basically influenced me um, for the rest of my life. I stayed in the uh, I worked in the Weiss lab for about three years, okay. and then I decided it was time to go to Europe. So with other friends who I'd met at Rockefeller, we all quit our jobs and took off for a three and a half month ride in a new Mercedes sedan that I had bought uh, all around Europe. But you came back? I came back and needed work because I had spent all my money and took a job then at uh, State University of New York downstate in the pharmacology department. And that was where I got my first introduction to muscle. Okay. It didn't go very deep, unfortunately, but um, I was asked to go to visit the laboratory of Taro Hayashi up at Columbia. And at the time, he had developed a method for isolating actomyosin from striated muscle, from skeletal muscle, and preparing uh, monolayers of the uh, isolated protein in a Langmuir trough with plastic barriers that allowed you to then compress that, my, that monolayer and come up with an actomyosin thread, which was amazing. I, and I built a myograph of sorts uh, mm -hmm. using a quartz rod that I pulled and could set up with hooks this uh, in a chamber, this thread, which we could stimulate with ATP and make contract. Now, the interest of the lab at the time was in ryanodyne, which we now know very well, but at the, back in the 50s was very much a mystery. And the uh, concept that we were testing in that lab was that ryanodyne exerted a direct effect on the contractile protein. 
We knew nothing about EC coupling at right. the time. But that didn't, really didn't interest me for long, and I decided I wanted to go back to Europe. Only this time, not come home broke. So I thought, okay, let's get a job in a lab in Europe. So that prompted me to revisit my friends at Rockefeller and Paul Weiss's lab. And one thing led to another. There were a group of expatriates of Hungary there at the time, all of whom had escaped Hungary at the late, late 1950s. And one couple, Dr. and Mrs. Uh, Matolci, were still at the Weiss lab. And they were friends with George Klein, who was head of the Tumor Biology Institute at Karolinska. And they said George was coming to New York the following week. Would I like to meet him? Maybe he could get me a job at Karolinska. Well, I had never been to Sweden, mm -hmm. so I thought, well, why not? So anyway, I met him, and within weeks, he, although he didn't have any openings, he connected me with Torbjorn Kasperson head of the Institute for Cell Research and Genetics. And lo and behold, they had a job. So that June, I sailed on a, <laughs> a very long boat ride to Sweden and started what was really a marvelous uh, year at Karolinska. What year was that? That was 1959-60. And you were there for a year. And a you year. came back to the States and ended up at SUNY? Back at SUNY, well, it wasn't just as simple as that. At uh, Karolinska, I was doing their electron microscopy. And most of it was for the people in the Kaspersen group. Right. But Ulf von Euler, who was, in, was next door in pharmacology, had the need for some electron microscopy. And he, of course, was interested in the storage and release of catecholamines. So they asked me whether I would be willing to do some preps for them. And little did I know how ugly a hagfish could be, <laughs> or how awful. Uh, but I watched them, uh, let's say, sacrifice the beast and pull its heart out, and uh, I should say isolate its heart. And then I did the microscopy on it. And this ended up being my first publication in yeah. Nature on uh, the demonstration that norepinephrine was stored in discrete granules in the heart of these cyclostomes and released from these granules. And that kind of lit a fire in terms of pharmacology and more wet science that I, than I had seen before. So that's why I, when I returned home, even though they wanted me to stay at Karolinska, I thought, you know, it's time. It's time to get, get busy go to school, and uh, hopefully have my own lab. So you came back to SUNY Brooklyn, so you right. literally came home. I came home, um, very literally, <laughs> and um, applied to the program in pharmacology at Downstate. Bob Furchgott was the chair, and Bob knew of all my adventures traveling, and. I uh, wasn't quite convinced that I was serious about graduate work, and uh, he thought I was a jet setter. Well, I think I was. Mm -hmm. This was before frequent flyer miles, unfortunately. <laughs> but anyway, um, I think what clinched it for me was that I needed to make up some prerequisite points for admission. And that meant going back after six years out of school to take calculus, and even worse, the second half of organic chemistry. And I did that at night, uh, willingly, because I really was convinced this was for me. And I don't know how much this was an obstacle, but a jet-setting woman was not anyone he had encountered before. I was the first woman to apply to their program. And Although not spoken, I had a feeling that helped uh, aggravate the situation a little bit. Well, he, he capitulated. He acquiesced. Yes, he did. And, and uh, uh, you end up working with Eric Cow in the department. Yes. Uh, tell us about the work you were doing and your experiences there. 
Yeah, well, I had met Eric at Rockefeller okay. years before. And he, at the time, was working with Chapo, another one of the Hungarian muscle people, on uterine smooth muscle. And I thought that was very interesting. And when I uh, came to Downstate for the interview, Eric saw me and convinced me that my future was sealed, that he, he could assure me a fantastic career in science if I uh, agreed to work in his lab. Well, how could I refuse? Um, so I said, sure. Um, and uh, at the time, we were, he was interested in active transport. This was before the discovery of the sodium potassium ATPase. And so we were working on ion distributions in the myometrium. Very tedious work, but you know, involving measurement of ion contents and uh, ion fluxes using isotopic sodium and potassium. Mm -hmm. It was pretty nasty work. But I did it and learned some electrophysiology. I had to measure membrane potentials to prove that I was dealing with active transport processes. So that was all a, good, a very good experience. And technically, in terms of the, the lab work that we did, I couldn't have asked, other than the Weiss lab, I couldn't have asked for a better environment. He was very rigorous, very good at, uh, at he had great hands mm -hmm. and very innovative. So I learned a lot there. You also explored uh, courses elsewhere in the city ah. to stoke your interests. Yeah, well, my interest in muscle was kind of a nagging one that lasted a long time. And it was fueled by seminars that I heard that were given by Anna Marie Weber, who was then at the Muscle Institute in Manhattan with Alexander Sandow, by um, Hasselbach, who was studying calcium transport in muscle, um, by Stuart Taylor, who was also a, a student of Sandow's, who was doing some very interesting work on EC coupling at the time, and by Manny Brust, who was on our faculty at Downstate, who was working on dystrophic muscle. And I was interested in muscle mechanics. And when I said that to Eric, he said, oh no, that's for the guys to do. Girls don't do that. I thought, come on, give me a break. But, but he insisted that was not going to happen. But, um, as luck would have it, uh, when I finished my work, he, he had convinced me to stay another year and run his lab. So I took that as an opportunity to take Sandow's biophysics course at NYU every Saturday morning for a year. And to kind of get the background that I needed, didn't have in my graduate studies in muscle. Mm -hmm. I must say I also enjoyed those topics in our physiology courses. So that was very important. But I think maybe because he said you can't do it, that bothered me enough to make me want to do it even more, <laughs> knowing myself as I do. After you completed uh, the year when, you were, when Eric was out of yeah. the country and you were running his lab, you applied for a job and you got a position here at Jefferson yes. Medical College as an instructor in physiology. Right. Obviously that was a challenge because your interests were in contractility. You had been doing a lot of transport type right. work with Eric and so making that transition both to be a faculty member, to be an instructor, to reorient your research program must have been a challenge. So let's hear a bit about it, that. It was a very important period in my life because when I, I mean, I had no experience teaching other than giving Eric's lectures to the medical students at Downstate when he was on sabbatical. That was actually good. I got to lecture on neuromuscular transmission and drugs that worked on the uterus. And Talking to a, a group of a mere 185 students was daunting. But anyway, I had already decided that I was going to look for a job in a physiology department because that was really my first love. With all, I make no apologies about that, but that, that's where my heart was. So got the job at Jefferson, and we're waiting for the building we're now in to be completed. So I didn't yet have a lab. <laughs> 
<clears throat> but I was trying to figure out how I would get to do muscle mechanics. But I was advised, I ar arrived on September 1st, 1967, and they said, oh, you know, there's an NIH deadline October 1st. You ought to write a grant. So I had time on my hands, and I quickly whipped one off, and lo and behold, it got funded. It was on transport. And I thought, well, I knew that best, right. and I thought I would start with that. But in the back of my mind was this nagging urge to do muscle. So one of my friends suggested that I visit Paul Bianchi, who was at, in the pharmacology department at Penn. Again, another great stroke of luck, because Paul actually became a lifelong mentor. He thought that it would be very good for me to get to meet other scientists in Philadelphia. So they had what was known as the Transport Workers Union. It was a group of people who obviously worked on transport, who met every month and gave seminars, and it was an opportunity for exchange. And the other one was the Mayo Bio Club, which was the muscle group. Well, Philadelphia, probably more than any other city in the world, had the best collection or aggregation of muscle uh, biophysicists anywhere. Uh, Lee Peachy, Clara Francini Armstrong, Bob Davis, Howard Holzer, Britton Chance. The list is long. It goes on and on and on. The Somlios were here. So I decided that I would go, and every month, I attended their seminars, and this was basically a, this was my postdoctoral experience. Because hearing those guys, who were the, clearly the biggest and the best, plus visitors from all over the world, uh, Doug Wilkie came, mm -hmm. I mean, for one, uh, Barani. I mean, there were so many. It was, it was a monthly event that I really looked forward to. But then there was the matter of, okay, you learn the theory, I knew what I wanted to do, but how do you build it and get it done? So luckily there was a young man who was interested in finding a sponsor for his thesis research, Alan Gordon, who came to me and asked whether he could work in my lab. Well, we had then just moved to this building, so I had a room. Until that time, I, I had nothing. And this was what year? This was September 67, and we moved in May 68. And the nice part was by then my grant was funded, so I could get started. And Alan, with his engineering background, was the perfect partner for building and setting up the apparatus we needed to do muscle mechanics. He was very innovative. Um, one of the toughest contraptions one needed uh, for force velocity measurements was uh, advice we couldn't afford to buy. So he, he basically put one together using a pen motor from a grass recorder and putting enough resistance in it to, that would uh, end up being a load that the muscle would have to work against when it was activated. But, tricks like that. It, it was amazing. So uh, we launched new studies on smooth muscle mechanics, about which very little was known. All right. And one of the worst problems about work that had been published was that the muscles showed spontaneous activity. Well, you certainly can't quantify anything under those conditions. Most people had used drugs to block nerves and stuff like that, and clearly these interfered with the activation of the muscle. And relying on my readings about transport and electrical potentials in smooth muscle, I took advantage of the fact that you could simply cool them. Uh, not do your experiments at 37 degrees. Do them at 20 degrees, 20 to 22 degrees. They were silent. They were healthy. They were responsive. They were obedient. Perfect preparations for, uh, for analyzing for analyzing the results. So that was the beginning. Now you came here as an instructor. Who was the chair at that time? Fred Friedman. 
And, and what and was it like in that department? Obviously, it was a relatively new building and a presumably relatively uh, small department. It, it, it wasn't as much small as it varied in terms of interest. But Fred Friedman saw that I was anxious to get going and do research. And what little resources he had, he gave me. Any help I needed, he gave me freely. Uh, he was extremely supportive, except when it came to salary. But that's a whole other issue. And that, that's a general issue in this country. But Friedman was really good to me and uh, uh, was more generous than any chair that followed. Uh, and he was here until 1974, and he retired. He was a GI physiologist, very uh, a student of Babkin's in Canada. And of course, smooth muscle was one of his favorite topics. So we got on very well. Within one year, he promoted me to assistant professor with tenure, okay. which was amazing, actually. Your career has been somewhat unusual in that you stayed here for since 1967. Uh, people leave, people go on sabbatical, but you've stayed. Uh, what do you ascribe that to? I think it was mainly because of the work I was able to do with no interference from anybody on the outside, no pressures. Um, I had, uh, by then, through the Mayo Bio, uh, enjoyed the enormous honor of being one of the founding members of the Pennsylvania Muscle Institute. So this was the idea of Andrew Somlio. And this, again, it was strictly, this, this emerged from the uh, Mayo Bio Club. His idea was to form an institute, which was basically a large program project involving muscle people from various universities in the city. And this was one of the biggest PPGs that uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood ever established. And it still exists to this day. Okay. So we started that in 1974. So one of the uh, ideas was that I had, realizing that muscle mechanics was not really an end in itself. Mm -hmm. By then, uh, Alan had graduated and gone off to do a postdoc in, with John Rubin in Grunfest Lab in New York. Okay. And um, I was very interested in partnering with Bob Davis to do energetics of smooth muscle. So the whole idea of doing the chemistry with the mechanics is very much a natural thing in muscle because it's probably the only tissue you can, that you can study both ways. And at that time, Tom Butler was a graduate student in Bob's lab. And he had just finished his work on frog muscle. And uh, I basically introduced him to smooth muscle, okay. which was a new world for Tom. Right. And the beginning of what has been a lasting partnership in research ever since that time. And that was what year? 74, uh, late 74, Tom started, and I started working together. And he later, in I think 76, uh, got an appointment here at Jefferson. So here we were, the two of us in the department, partnering in our research and all our grants uh, ever since. And that's not something you give up very easily. There were opportunities to leave. But I thought this was so good. And the uh, the, the collaborations and the interactions with the folks at Penn in PMI were was something nothing no no appointment I could imagine or encountered could compete with. So I stayed, and it was successful for you. It worked. So the research worked very well, and the activities I got involved with in the Physiology Society here in Philadelphia with APS, with you later on study section, provided really balance to my career. And I also, of course, got very involved with teaching and with my students here, which was kind of the other half of my professional life. 
equally important, I must say, for the research. Well, I think uh, the sad thing is sometimes uh, people focus on their research and forget about the importance yeah. of teaching and educating. How were you able to maintain a balance? Well, these are two things that I love very much. I had only a few really good teachers, and I would say those who were my best teachers and who I could also connect with in terms of the science uh, made a lasting impression. I loved what I was teaching, very simply, and I wanted to be able to bring that story to my students in a coherent way, not make some of the mistakes that my own teachers had made, and to translate some of the most difficult topics, for instance, electrophysiology, to them in a way that they could handle it, understand it, and use it. And this was something that took years to, to evolve in terms of developing a teaching style. But very important to me was also the idea that you didn't lecture at people, or, but rather converse with them. So my lectures, I think, even though they're organized and, and very carefully planned, are tend to be more a dialogue mm -hmm. with certainly invitations to ask questions and interact with students as I go along. But it's, it's a labor of love, and that makes it work. Well, I know you've gotten a number of teaching awards here at Jefferson, uh, and clearly that suggests that others believe your teaching and teaching style was most successful. So I congratulate you on Thank that. Thank you. You mentioned uh, our association and the study section. I ran the physiology study section from 78 to 85 and brought you in in 1979 for a four-year sense, I mean service, yes. to the NIH. Yeah. Tell me about your thoughts and your experiences about serving on study section and perhaps in so doing giving advice to others on uh, service to NIH. Well, that was, uh, I'm, I have to say I was both honored and somewhat intimidated by the invitation. Um, the review process was very much a mystery in those days. and. When I looked at the roster for the physiology study section, I thought, my God, these are the people whose papers I had read and was reading as a student of physiology, which I still believe I am to this day, the authors of the books, the chapters that I read. And I was absolutely frightened. And thank you very much for giving me, among the grants I, I felt very comfortable handling. One bummer that was, uh, I shouldn't call it that, a very difficult grant, let's we won't, say. We won't name names. No, oh, I don't remember who, who wrote it. I, I don't know that it ever mattered. I, I just read the grant, and it was on heart muscle. And something just didn't feel right, and so I spent a great deal of time researching it and reading and checking and making sure. and. There was basically a very uh, major flaw in the grant that would preclude uh, letting it go forward. So I wrote the review, and I, I, I would say I spent a, a good week on it. Um, and in those days, I don't know whether it was typical, but I know I got at least a dozen grants to review, which was uh, a very uh, big assignment. Well, you were a newbie, and we tried. To break, we, we were trying to break you in, so we would give you about a dozen. Thanks. Yeah, with no page limits. Right. Uh, Hundred-page grants were all also very entertaining. But anyway, this grant was a big problem. So we come to the meeting, and who do I get to sit down next to? But no one, none other than Fred Julian, who of course I knew well from his work, but not in person on muscle mechanics. And being relatively new to that field, I thought, oh my god, what, what's going to happen? So anyway, I read my review. And the discussion went on. And Fred soon leaned over 
and whispered in my ear, how did you know that? Regarding my critique of the grant, he basically agreed with me and wondered, how did I know that? Well, I, I didn't tell him how long I had spent <laughs> studying it to get it right, but I kind of breathed a sigh of relief because I realized then I could probably do it. But the experience of meeting three times a year for a few days with people who are quite clearly the leaders in biophysics, very, I mean, whether it was transport or muscle contraction or channel biophysics, whatever, people like Bert Hiller, um, one of my heroes, Walter Woodbury. I mean, there were so many, George Sachs in transport. And, I don't want to start naming because I don't want to offend anybody by forgetting, but Clay, okay, Clay Armstrong, can't forget him. Um, these were amazing people. And to hear them discuss the grants for the science, trying to achieve the highest level of science, and fund it, obviously, was a real lesson. Because it, this is the only way you could ever know what where was that bar set? Mm -hmm. What were the expectations? What made a grant clear and easy to read and understandable? How do you formulate your arguments? Asking, what questions are you asking? How are you going to answer them? That probably helped me more in grant writing than anything else. And no experience has ever come close to that. I looked forward to every meeting. Uh, it, it was just terrific. I know you didn't plan it that way, but it turned out to be that way. Well, you were a great member of the study section, and I remember That's it fondly. And uh, the interactions were just a lot of fun. Uh, I used to find that, find that to be a great yeah. experience. Uh, you also uh, were very active. You were active in the APS. Yes. Uh, you headed up the muscle section or interest group right you were our first chair of the section advisory committee uh, tell us a little bit about your interactions within APS well APS was wonderful uh, because it really how much should I pay you to say that you not you didn't you still made me pay my full dues oh, okay I refused to be a senior citizen member you know okay. even with the discount thank you uh, I, I'm den in complete denial with in terms of that uh, title. Anyway, um, it, what I enjoyed very much about science, science was meeting colleagues from all over the world. And it was quite clear that no matter where you go in the world, you'll always be able to find people you can talk science with, whatever the language, whatever the country. And these were colleagues, and it was better than just reading them, mm -hmm. reading their papers, and maybe arguing with them. And, stuff, but I enjoy the, the intellectual interactions and the personal interactions. And so when the fate of muscle at the physiology meetings were, came to question, of course I felt I had to play some active role, role in preserving it. So we kind of, I mean, we were competing with biophysics at right. the time. And I didn't, I kind of felt that was like uh, having a mistress or, a, or, what, or the male equivalent of that. And that wasn't fair. I didn't want us to be undermined. However valuable biophysics was, I didn't want to see us get lost. So I worked very hard with people to get the muscle group organized. And even though we didn't become a section, we got some very good symposia going. And that attracted people who would ordinarily present at biophysics right. to come to our meetings. So that was good. It was kind of a, a silent war, I guess. But I, anyway, think, I think that's an issue. Worked. That's an issue that APS has dealt with, being the Mother Society founded in 1887, right. and biophysics broke off created in the 50s. Many physiologists were involved with it. Neuroscience right. broke out off in the late 60s. Many physiologists were part of it. We've spawned many societies, and I think that's one of the challenges right. that we all have to face. 
In your long career on smooth muscle, uh, you've made some contributions. And what do you think the most significant ones have been to our understanding of smooth muscle function? Yikes, that's hard. But one of the things I learned early on uh, through the collaboration with Bob Davies was uh, clearly rigor in, in the research. I don't mean rigor now. This is not a bad pun. This is rigor. And um, what was known about, I mean, very smooth muscle was kind of the orphan child of right. muscle. Skeletal was the, the uh, prime uh, experimental object, cardiac, uh, a little more confusing, very difficult, but closer to smooth muscle, certainly, than, than skeletal. What was not known at all was anything about the energetics or the kinetics of cross-bridge activity in smooth muscle. So people had done heat measurements uh, way back in the early days. Bosler and others had done that to measure the energy cost of contraction. And of course, that's a very, very derived uh, way of, of, of getting at behavior. So, as was Bob's practice and, and his repertoire in skeletal muscle, we decided to go after the hard numbers to really determine the high energy phosphate usage during classical isometric uh, or work production experiments in smooth muscle. So, with Tom and I basically worked out the methods to be able to do that, which were very complicated. And we published a lot of papers on that, giving, giving hard numbers where you could really now set all muscle types at the same level and make valid comparisons, not by extrapolation. Right. So that was a big deal. It was very laborious, very uh, tedious work, but we had a good time doing it. And um, so that was part of it. And then the, the I mean, what was important was being able to show what was known as the economy of smooth muscle, meaning that smooth muscle was able to maintain force with very low energy cost, was a big mystery. But we provided the hard numbers for that and uh, began to do stuff on the regulation of contraction as well by light chain phosphorylation, was, which was discovered in the 80s. So our work basically provided the foundation for what later was known as the latch hypothesis. Okay. And this emanated from Dick Murphy's lab in right. UVA. And it was largely, ba it was really based on measurements of velocity of shortening as a function of time during long-term contractions in smooth muscle. We had already shown by the uh, energy usage that the energy usage was very, very low for force maintenance compared to development. And that meant that cross-bridge cycling was low. Right. Murphy, with the help of Steve Driska, who had right. trained with uh, Dave Hartshorn, uh, learning, doing the phosphorylation measurements, correlated the slowing of cross-bridge cycling with the dephosphorylation of the light chains of myosin. And that was the basis of the latch hypothesis. Okay. And What's interesting is I, I had gone down to UVA to give a seminar, and Dick asked me, well, what should we call this phenomenon? Is it catch? And I said, I mean, catch was well known for right. a very economical state of force maintenance that was shown in invertebrate muscle right. and shellfish. And I said, no, you better not do that because the regulation is very different. So there was a student sitting in the library with us at the time, Valerie Fatigatti was her name. She popped up, why don't we call it Latch? And, and it was, stuck. And she did it. She named it. It stuck. She never got credit for it, for naming it, but it was named Latch. Anyway, that was the beginning of uh, a lot of questions and answers about how did Latch, did their hypothesis and the simple dephosphorylation of light chains fully account for the economy. And lots of people spent years basically doing experiments that confirmed 
-hmm. that hypothesis. But Tom and I took another tack. We decided we would challenge the hypothesis. And we looked for other variables under which the, the very simple picture did not hold. Okay. And that just grew into more new discoveries. Uh, certainly, I mean, our lab as well as the Somalio showed that cooperative, cooperative activation of cross bridges was very important. We did it by doing ADP turnover okay. on uh, muscle. They did other techniques, and their contributions regarding sen calcium sensitization uh, processes were extremely important. It was very interesting because at that time, people knew that the kinase that led to the phosphorylation was regulated by calcium. We knew nothing about the phosphatase. But it was our graduate student, Laura Trinkle Mulcahy, quite by accident, uh, during her thesis work in our lab, uh, was able to prove that the phosphatase was also regulated. So this broke open a myriad of studies that still go on to this day on other regulatory pathways in signal transduction. And of course, the idea of calcium sensitization, right. which was largely phosphatase based. So the early latch hypothesis, although textbooks had not altogether caught up with it, have just blossomed into a, what seems like a never ending story about signal transduction mechanisms in smooth muscle. So that was one of our big, big things. The other was catch. Catch itself in invertebrates. And we were troubled because mammalian muscle was so difficult to study because of the, all these regulatory processes. We thought, let's go back to the shellfish, to the edible blue muscle. Okay. which you've probably eaten with garlic and tomato sauce and, and it's wine. Excellent. It's great. Uh, but these little beasts uh, have a muscle known as the anterior byssus retractor muscle. And the byssus is the gland that makes those nasty threads that you've got to clean off before you eat them. But the idea is that those are tethers that hold the muscle in place in the ocean so they don't bob around. And the muscle that holds them is a retractor muscle that can stay contracted for hours, if not days. Uses little or no energy. Okay. This was the penultimate model of economy. So we went back to the Italian market, got ourselves lots of muscles, cheapest experiments that we ever did. Buck and a half a pound of muscles would keep you working for a month. Thanks to Richard Lynn and uh, other enlightened uh, reviewers, we got a, a wonderful grant funded that uh, lasted some 15 years, thanks to the NIH at the time. Anyway, what did we discover? That it wasn't a matter of crossbridge kinetics that allowed this smooth, this unique smooth muscle to maintain force forever. It was because there was a tether, another protein, called twitchin, okay. which was first described by, I believe, Guy Benyon. And uh, it's a mini titan, not, okay. un, you know, not right. very much unlike titan that we know well in cardiac and skeletal muscle. And basically, the reason the cost of contraction is so cheap is that twitchin, which is tightly bound to myosin also binds to actin. When muscle is stimulated, even when the stimulus ceases, twitchin binds both filaments, cross bridges can pop off, right. and force can be maintained for as long as that twitchin stays bound. So the trick was to find out what made catch release, mm -hmm. what made it relax. We knew from years of work by Betty Twarg, who unfortunately passed away this year, uh, that serotonin was the key ingredient. Uh, Akazi had shown years later that cyclic AMP levels in the tissue uh, became higher when stimulated with serotonin, but that was it. Mm -hmm. We decided to 
to make use of the technology we had used for studying energetics using caged compounds and stuff like that uh, to basically test to see what was cyclic AMP doing. And lo and behold, the only, there was one protein that lit up in this muscle and it was twitching. So twitching became phosphorylated and that led to the release of the tether and relaxation of muscle. So this question about catch, which was first described in the late 1890s mm -hmm. by von Uxel, uh, uh, was finally solved in the late 1990s. When we were preparing for this interview, we talked a little bit about some of the research you're starting to do now and how it has origins back into your early career uh, in terms of the protein that you're looking at and contractility. Uh, let, can you talk a little bit about what you're doing now in terms of uh, research? Yeah, um, basically, actually it was in the late 90s, or actually early 90s, if I, my memory serves me right, we were interested in what happens to smooth muscle in disease states. There was great interest in uh, the changes that occur in the composition and mechanical behavior of blood vessels, say, in hypertension and diseases like that. So we th most of our models were GI smooth muscles. Right. So one of the obvious uh, models was uh, megacolon, as occurs in Hirschsprung's disease. And that had not been studied. And that's unusual because it's a large lumen hypertrophy. So we did studies which really defined the changes, how that muscle remodeled mm -hmm. as a result of rectal obstruction. And uh, that and then some studies we did on pulmonary hypertension, where there's also remodeling of, vascular, uh, of pulmonary intravascular smooth muscle. Uh, so that became uh, very interesting. But there were a lot of questions that persisted after the work was done that we never could fully answer. And that really ended up uh, one of these um, piles of papers that sat on my desk for a number of years, unpublished data that we didn't know what to do with. Why was it that certain smooth muscles could shorten to extremely short lengths yet others, which had become fibrotic, say, right. in disease, could not. So using what we had learned about Hirschsprung's disease, as well as two very unique but well-defined smooth muscles, one that had, was very fibrotic, namely the tinea coli of the rabbit, which we had used for years, and the anococcygeus muscle of the rat, which is if any muscle ever, ever, any smooth muscle wanted to be a skeletal muscle, that is it. It's a strap muscle. Okay. And beautiful to work with, had no passive tension. So using these as models together with studies on energetics and stiffness, we're able to show, I think quite convincingly, that structure ultimately limited function. The mere fact that you had elements that resisted compression or extension would really set the stage for the operating range of smooth muscles under normal or disease conditions. Mm -hmm. So more recently, I turned to the diabetic model, which surprisingly, other than uh, measurements of stress-strain relationships of uh, using balloon manometry on animals or people giving equations, but no answers about cellular physiology became attractive. And um, I've gone back to looking at that and with some very interesting results. And hopefully we'll extend this to other disease states as well. You've been chair here now for about 10 years, a little bit more than that. Uh, any thoughts about serving as a chair and dealing with uh, research with university administration? That's a dangerous question. Well, I should point out that 
Um, Alan Leffer had been chair here for 27 years and retired in 2001. And um, our dean asked me whether I would serve as interim chair. I willingly accepted. And this, the understanding was this would be something I'd do for a couple of years until they got around to hiring a permanent chair. Well, uh, let's just say the climate changed a lot uh, during that first year in the department. And we were doing so well, they decided, me to, they decided to appoint me chair of physiology. So my, my condolences. Thank you. That was a first for Jefferson. Okay. First woman chair. Um, I had already been a pioneer of being the first woman to be promoted to professor in basic sciences. And you can look at this two ways. It's an honor, but there are things you shouldn't have to be a pioneer in at this stage mm -hmm. in life, but that, that's the way it was. Anyway, I'm still here. I'm still hoping they'll hire a new chair okay. so I can get back to my lab full time to doing other things. But the best part has been the occasions where I was able to recruit people and basically watch them grow and help start launch careers or fortify those that were already in underway. And um, I don't know if it's a maternal instinct or not, but it's the, I get the same kicks out of that as I get when I see my students succeed. And uh, it's, it's a very unique pleasure in, in seeing that, and I see it as growth. That's where the future is, and uh, I'm hoping that that will happen. Marion, thank you for telling us about your research career. You've had a number of people who have given you advice over your career, and I was wondering if you have some words of advice for young people starting out today in their professional careers. Well, first I should correct your comment. I didn't have enough people giving me advice. Um, mine was almost a mentor-less career. And I would say that um, I flew by the seat of my pants most of the time, basically f discovering and doing what I liked okay. and doing it as well as I could. It would have been nice to have advice now and then. But one lesson I've learned is that to succeed in science, you've got to love it. And it's a very difficult profession. You're subject to peer review at every turn, whether you're writing, whether you're speaking, uh, at a meeting, whether you're teaching. You're always being judged by your most recent good idea. And there's nothing that can be as painful as to be shown to be a fool. Thank goodness I, that hasn't happened to me yet, but I've seen it happen to others. But anyway, the idea is that it's very challenging. Your ideas, your creativity are probably as close to any, you know, closer to your heart than anything you could be doing. So you need to love it. You've got to be able to cope with the disappointments and to thoroughly enjoy the triumphs. And I can be having the worst day in the world and an experiment goes well, or I'm doing some microscopy and I see something new and exciting, and suddenly all the bad stuff goes away. So if you can find balance in your life, that way it's very important. I think it's also important to interact with colleagues in the scientific community. There's no end to what you can learn from others um, through discourse regarding your results or whether it's science in general or about life in general. Uh, these are very special friends and colleagues, and it can really enrich your life enormously. I just, I think in terms of advice, you have to be strong, be committed, be persistent. Have the courage of your convictions, but be prepared for defeat. But if you love it enough, don't give it up. Thank you, Marion, for your advice. Thank you on behalf of the Society for being willing to sit for the Living History Project to share 
with our listeners information about your career and your experiences. It has truly been a pleasure for me to learn a little bit more about your career, and I hope everybody who watches the video will also find it a wonderful experience. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Marty. It's been a pleasure.